perception is reality. The phrase was repeated to us over and over until it seemed more like a joke than a cautionary warning. We were separated from the male Coast Guard Academy cadets and told to look out for each other, that the enlisted men would try to make us their conquests. We had heard rumors about female cadet sluts caught sleeping around during their summer assignments. These so-called sluts were ostracized for their illicit relationships, formally punished, and restricted to base when they returned to the academy. Whether the rumors were true or not didn't matter. A military woman's reputation was everything. Professors, male officers, female officers, and senior female cadets all told us so. Perception is reality, they said. My first experience on a Coast Guard cutter was the summer before my senior year as a cadet at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. I was assigned for an 80-day patrol to the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Morgenthau, a 378-foot ship with a permanent crew of 162 and an additional 13 cadets for the patrol. All of us cadets were to be fully integrated with the crew for the patrol in the Eastern Pacific Ocean on a counter-narcotics mission. The engineers did their best to make me feel welcome and put me right to work. As the ship sailed off into the Pacific Ocean on that first day, I was happy doing the simple task of cleaning thick black gunk off of a piece of machinery to the comforting rumble of the giant engines, muffled by the double hearing protection of foam inserts and big earmuffs. I felt optimistic about the patrol and excited to be part of the crew and to learn everything I could about the ship. That night, I was walking through the labyrinth of the ship's passageways and stairwells with one of the male enlisted crew members, completing a task from my academy summer checklist. He was bringing the captain's night orders to each of the night watchstanders for them to read and sign. The hallway's usual fluorescent lights were turned off and replaced by the dim blue of a darkened ship after sunset. People heading to and from the outer decks couldn't risk having their night vision ruined by bright lights. We climbed deep into the steel belly of the vessel to the combat information center. Inside, the CIC was lit with the same faint blue lights and everyone was dressed in dark blue uniforms. I could tell where the watchstanders were only by their silhouettes against the glow of computer and radar screens. The man who led us in the door signed the night orders and asked the watchstander who'd brought them. So dude, we got a bunch of female cadets on board now. You fuck any of them? I spoke up out of the darkness, a disembodied voice, overly cheery and distinctly female. Not yet, just give us a few days. <laughs> I couldn't believe the ship's crew had not even lasted 24 hours before making jokes about us. The man spit out a few curse words and stuttered a hasty apology. The next day, he found me in the hallway in front of my living area and apologized profusely, saying, I'm so sorry, ma'am. I shouldn't have said that. I would never have said that if I knew you were there. <laughs> he was terrified I would report him. The entire crew had been given a cover our asses sexual harassment training and preparation of the female cadets arriving. It would look bad for the command if anything happened to us cadets while we were stationed on board the ship. I decided not to say anything about the incident, knowing that the whole crew would treat me differently if I did. I already felt unwelcome in my birthing area, bunking with enlisted women who were a few years older than me, worked in different departments, and scolded me for bringing oily boots and uniforms into their sanctum. Even the engineers who were beginning to act like I was one of them would quickly label me as overly sensitive and be cautious of every word they said around me. I didn't want to be known as the girl who ratted guys out, so I laughed it off and accepted the apology. I decided that his comment had annoyed me, not offended. I wanted to be part of the crew without attracting any extra attention. The next night, the women officers gathered the female cadets in their stateroom to lecture us about interacting with the mostly male crew. They told about the time they'd gone dancing at a popular bar in Costa Rica on a port call and had a few pina coladas with some of the crew. Before their hangovers were gone, ugly rumors had begun to spread across the ship the way a drop of diesel spreads its polluting rainbow the moment it touches water. They reiterated the cautionary phrase, Perception is reality. 
and told us they had begrudgingly accepted that they couldn't hang out with anyone but the other officers in port calls. After that meeting, the other female cadets and I made a pact. We would enjoy the patrol, make friends, and look out for each other. I refused to believe that perception was reality. Two days later, the highest ranking engineer on board, the engineer officer, or EO, took me aside. He was concerned, he said, that I was already getting a reputation for being too friendly with the men. I'd been seen in a public area talking to male enlisted members. Because I was working in his department, he felt responsible for ensuring I wasn't fraternizing with enlisted men. I told him, Sir, we were sitting on the mess deck together because they were helping me study firefighting equipment. All of the engineers are men except one, so how can I learn the job without being seen talking to men? I would think it'd be more suspicious to study in secret. It doesn't matter what you were working on, he said. You need to be more careful about who you are seen with and how you are perceived. I ignored his advice, continuing to study and work in public. The male cadets hadn't received any of these lectures about how they were perceived, so I saw no reason why I should act differently. I knew I wasn't doing anything wrong, and I wouldn't let the EO's wild imagination stop me from becoming the best engineer possible. I knew what the mechanic said about the EO behind his back. He read the equipment manuals from cover to cover, but couldn't turn a wrench to save his life. I did not want to become an officer like him. On board the Morgenthau, I sketched system diagrams by hand, memorized operating parameters, conducted maintenance, and passed an oral examination to or in order to qualify as a generator watch stander. In four hour shifts, I oversaw the six foot tall diesel engines that powered the electrical system of the ship. One day near the end of the patrol, one of the ship's service diesel generators had been shut down for routine maintenance and I was told to start it back up. Two of the other female cadets came to the engine room to watch the procedure. I climbed on top of the machinery and pointed to a lever as the EO walked into the engine room, right past us and into the soundproof control room. Is anyone out there even qualified? He asked the head engineer on watch, a bald chief with a bushy mustache. The chief replied sarcastically, well, sir, occasionally we have qualified watchstanders. Then in a more serious tone, she passed her qual board and you signed her letter. Did you think we wouldn't let her stand watch on her own? The EO left the engine room while I completed the starting procedures for the generator. When I returned to the control room, the chief was angry, defensive of my abilities, and in disbelief that the officer would treat me that way. But after two months at sea, I was more surprised by the ferocity of his defense of me than I was of the EO thinking I was incompetent. By the end of the summer, all the female cadets were friends with crew members, and many were rumored to be sleeping with them. It felt like if we had any casual conversation with a crew member, let alone a friendly relationship, we would be judged as sluts. One female cadet told me before our last port call, everyone already thinks I'm fucking Mikey. I might as well have some fun. <laughs> After 30 straight days at sea, the ship pulled into San Diego for a final port call. The school year at the academy was scheduled to start in a week, and a few of the cadets had decided to spend a couple days in the city before heading home for a short vacation. As the cadets and crew walked off the ship, I noticed all the female cadets staying behind had paired up with enlisted guys and were working, we'd been working with for the last two months. I'd spent the entire patrol fighting for a good reputation as a woman engineer. I was frustrated with how poorly I'd been treated by the officers on board, and I knew that I no longer cared what they thought of me. I stood on the pier by the ship and watched as my friends, enlisted and cadets alike, began walking toward downtown San Diego. In a spontaneous decision of rebellion against the expectations placed on me as a future officer, I ran after them, not caring who saw me. When we all ended up hanging out at a hotel, I picked a mechanic who was decent looking, then I got drunk and spent the next two days having my way with him. <laughs> <laughs>
He was a few years older than me, more experienced, and more mature than most of the single guys from the ship. That was the first time I'd ever had sex with someone without having an emotional relationship first. After that, I returned to the academy for my senior year. None of the female cadets on the Morgenthau told anyone else about our illicit relationships with enlisted men. No one found out, and no one at the academy called us sluts. I was proud of the bond we'd formed on the Morgenthau, but the women couldn't tell anyone else or risk all of us getting a bad reputation. I wanted to believe that I hadn't let those on board the ship dictate what I could or couldn't do. But the truth is, I wouldn't have fucked that enlisted guy if the officers hadn't tried to isolate me from the crew. <laughs> I did it because I knew I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> I wanted to forget about my future career as an officer, to just spend a couple days hanging out with my friends and having sex with a guy I'd never speak to again. Your perception is not my reality. Thank you. That was Tenley Lozano.